Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is another episode of Dadvice TV Live. And for those of you that are new, welcome. It's great to have you here. Go ahead, say hello in the comments. Introduce yourself. We have a great community here that is very helpful, supportive, and positive. And for those of you that are new, let me quickly introduce myself. My name's James and I have kidney disease. I was diagnosed just over two years ago with stage five kidney failure, spent a week in the ICU, got my, my health up a little bit, but I have used diet and lifestyle changes, exercising, keeping control of my blood pressure and things like that to improve my overall health, which has allowed me to lift up my kidney labs a little bit, and I'm now considered stage three. My GFR is down there in the lower 30s, but I am feeling great. Now with us today, back again, you guys love him. He is retired nephrologist and author of Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, the best book for kidney disease out there. Anyone who's got it, this is the book that I strongly recommend you get if you don't have it already. Dr. Steven Rosansky, also known as Dr. Rowe. Hey, Dr. Rowe. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good to be here. And I was telling James, I got to celebrate my 74th birthday. Woo yeah, happy happy birthday. Been, but feeling healthy and enjoying life. Feel very lucky. Very lucky. Uh, now, for those that are new, tell yeah. them a little bit about your background. So I uh, practice um, nephrology kidney specialist uh, for over 40 years. And um, I did a lot of research and a lot of clinical work. <clears throat> um, and tonight's topic is, is high blood pressure. And actually um, one of the charter members of the American Society of Hypertension. And I'm gonna tell you a couple of funny stories about that organization tonight as we uh, talk about high blood pressure. But I've done a lot of research on the issue of uh, kidney disease and what's serious and what's not serious, as well as what makes sense regarding uh, dialysis. Uh, we've discussed on this program a few times the trend to start people way too early on dialysis. And I, mm -hmm. I highly recommend anyone who is Faced with that decision, please take a look at my book, discuss what's in my book with your uh, providers because it could save you from unnecessary dialysis, unnecessary surgical procedures, and it will also hopefully alleviate a lot of concerns for many, many people with early stage kidney disease, which for most of you is not something you really need to worry about. Yep. So tonight, awesome. tonight, tonight. Tonight we're going to get into. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to your dietitians, including Jen and Yay! some of these other people. And I'm going to start out by by mea culpa. I am going to give you something that I'm not proud of. And I uh, there's a survey that was done about people that come to their doctors that have high blood pressure, and the question is how often do doctors give advice? about sodium in their diet oh. and take a guess take a guess how often so if i have a great doctor and that was a huge thing but my doctor is very rare he is huge on exercise um just living a whole healthy lifestyle so i'm going to guess as far as doctors go they don't usually recommend dietitians very often so i'm going to say less than 20 percent well it's about half. cutting back on sodium <laughs> It's about half that even that even okay. bring it up, but but guess what? And and my wife actually suggested she says the patients are smarter. They know if they got high blood pressure because it's or it's common wisdom that should reduce your salt. But I'm mm -hmm. going to tell you some funny stories about my expertise and uh, this this uh, society of hypertension as we get into tonight's uh, show. So um, let's start out by talking about who's got high blood pressure. If you've got kidney problems, eight out of 10 of you are gonna have high blood pressure. If you got an EGFR of 60 or less, eight out of 10, very, very common. And as we've talked about many times, 
Blood pressure is just one of the factors like an abnormal kidney number that will relate to the probability of you getting problems with your heart, your blood vessels. And so you want to do the right things to decrease your risk of getting a heart attack, a stroke, having blood vessel problems for your blood supply to your legs and, and, and get progressive uh, kidney problems. So it's one of the things that we want to address, including other lifestyle factors that we've talked about. Smoking, get rid of the cigarettes, exercise is key. And we'll talk a bit about diet tonight and uh, try to get adequate rest and um, try to decrease your stress in life. All of these things are what everyone who's got kidney problems and high blood pressure needs to address. But today we'll focus on your blood pressure. First thing is blood pressure readings. I talk to so many patients and, um, and friends of mine, they go, oh, wh what's your blood pressure? Well, I went to the doctor and my number was, you know, 140 over 70. I go, <laughs> well, is that, what does that mean? It's nothing. It doesn't really mean anything. What am I driving at? Blood pressure is a 24 hour mm -hmm. a day phenomenon and your blood pressure the effects of blood pressure are going to be long-term effects, just like the effects of cholesterol, effects of your diabetes. They're long-term effects. It's not any given level. So you got to have yourself a blood pressure monitor. And James doesn't have his available. There's lots of them. No, neither Go of mine. I have, a, I have a large one. I think it's Omron is the name. I could be butchering it. I have one of those right next to my bed. Um, it's very, very accurate. It's got a lot of cables. That's the only thing I don't like about it. And then I have a Withings portable one. It's probably in my backpack because when I go to work, I take it with me. It's super yeah. tiny, runs off a rechargeable battery, and so I here, keep an eye on my blood pressure. Here, here's the deal. There is going to be more accurate and less accurate machines. You don't need to mm -hmm. spend a lot of money. There's even the finger blood pressure monitor. Here's the deal. You get enough blood pressure data, just like you get enough kidney function numbers that we talked about. It's, it's the trend of your data that matters. So you want to accumulate, you don't need to check it like every, you know, couple times a day. You could check it periodically and I'll tell you when the best times that you should check it. So um, one of the things that I did a lot of research on is 24 hour blood pressure. There's machines, I don't know if any of you have heard of this, that you can wear to check your 24 hour blood pressure. And um, I've, I've published a lot on that whole issue. So just to know your blood pressure may be 120 during the day. And guess what? When you go to sleep, normal blood pressure may be 90. So there's a circadian pattern of your blood pressure. It goes up during the day and goes down at night. One of the things that is most uh, critical for you folks who are being treated with high blood pressure is to be sure you're not being overtreated because you have something called white coat hypertension. What does that mean? A lot of us get nervous when we go to the doctor and our blood pressure goes up. Yep. So what you want to do, like James, you want to check your blood pressure under working conditions, you want to check it at home, and you want to get the trend of your pattern. Most importantly, because I've seen too much over treatment of blood pressure. If you're starting to feel like you're weak or dizzy and it's time for your blood pressure dose, check your blood pressure. Do not overdose yourself on blood pressure medicines, something nobody tells you about. And I've seen it happen over and over again that people get bad kidney outcomes, brain outcomes, heart outcomes from too low blood pressure. So my suggestion- yeah, and actually, I like to emphasize that point. Um, I thought lower was better. And my doctor explained, no, no, no. Your blood pressure is kind of what powers your kidneys. You know, the blood's pumping through there and your kidneys need it to be within a certain range. If it's too high, it can cause damage. And if it's too low, your kidneys aren't gonna be able to work right. So we gotta, there's that Goldilocks zone. We just gotta keep our blood pressure in there. And that, that'll be a, I'll, I'll get to that target is what we call it, target blood pressure for different people. It's going to be different uh, for some uh, situ different situations. So 
Um, so you want to repeat your blood pressure. You want to make sure that you're doing it right. And what does that mean? You want to make sure you have the cuff on right. They're very self-explanatory. You also want to rest for five minutes and keep the you keep your your arm at your level of your heart. Right, put it on a desk, and um, and you want your blood pressure cuff to wrap around at least one and a quarter to one and a half times. If it's too low, if it's too small, you got a big arm, you're going to get a falsely high reading. So be careful that you take your blood pressure. You you want to rest five minutes. You want to check it, and you want to check it in both arms, and you want to just see that the numbers are, are pretty close together. And that's going to be roughly what your blood pressure is. Now so, I do uh, all of that except the both arm. I always did my dominant arm because I'm right-handed. Right. So I would always do that one thinking it would be the more accurate. It, you Here's the deal. There are some people that have markedly different blood pressures in both arms. I, I'm not going to get into the reasons for it, but there's several things that could happen. And so if you've got markedly different readings in, in your two arms. You really need to let your doctor check that out and figure out why that is and figure out if there's theoretically a blockage of the blood flow on one arm, that might not be giving you the right reading. That's gonna be pretty rare. So um, what about blood pressure and your kidneys? So this is the old chicken and egg story. And I've actually done some original research on, you know, time uh, time uh, sequence blood pressure data versus kidney function changes over time. It was a really tough study. But the bottom line is, it's a chicken and egg thing. High blood pressure can mess your kidneys up. And as we said, if you've got kidney, you've got an EGFR less than 60, likely you're going to have high blood pressure. And um, the patients with high blood pressure as the only thing that we doctor, kidney doctors can find for your kidney uh, problem, we will call it hypertensive nephropathy. And the way they make the diagnosis, a long history of high blood pressure, um, no other cause we can find, you don't have a lot of protein in the urine, and so we don't do biopsies, we say, well, you probably got a high blood pressure related kidney problem. So um, what about uh, target blood pressures? Now, um, the target blood pressure, if you are a patient, and, and we've discussed this a few times, that has a good bit of protein in the urine, you're likely to have a more rapid decline of your kidney function. So normally, your goal should be 120 to 130. That's cool. But if you are one, especially if you're a younger person and you've got consistently two plus protein in the urine or 300 uh, milligrams per day or more in the urine, you're a at-risk patient to lose kidney function more rapidly. And for you, I would shoot for 110 to 120. Now, why don't we do it for everyone? James just said, too low, your kidneys won't be happy. And we also discuss, and we're gonna talk about diet later in the show, the low protein, where does that fit in? Again, don't be buying into this low protein, protein supplement stuff because it's not necessary for over 90, 95% of you. Mm -hmm. There are, there is a small group of people that may be watching the show that have CKD4 in that range. You know, you have a kidney number between 15 and 30. You've got a good bit of protein in the urine. In that case, I would consider a very low protein diet with keto analogs and a 110 to 120 goal. But that's gonna be the smaller percentage of folks with high blood pressure. For yeah. most and of you, 120 to 130 is okay. that's the top number. Yeah. Does, the, does the bottom number really matter? We, I don't think the bottom number, we used to think that the bottom number was all that mattered. And it turned out that the top number, which is your systolic blood pressure, the bottom number is your diastolic blood pressure. The normal value for systolic is 120. The normal value for diastolic is 80. Uh, a early mild hypertension is 130 to 140. A little bit more significant high blood pressure would be those with over 140. 
And that's kind of the, that's a top number. The top. Yeah, number. And that number was recently lowered to that because it used to be 140 and above. And now they're from based on studies, they, they want it a little bit lower. Correct. And, and yeah, exactly. And the most recent studies, and it's, and it's a moving target. I mean, I've been following this over, over many, many decades. I go to these, these blood pressure meetings every year and, and new studies come out and they change it. But, but the, the main reason why we can't say the lower, the better is exactly what James said earlier. And that his doctor explained to him too low is no good. And if you're feeling weak or dizzy, make sure you check your blood pressure. If you're weak or dizzy and you're like 110 or less, hold the dose of medicine. Wait till your next dose. If, if you're back up over 130, you're fine. If you're staying low, tell your doctor, you don't need to continue your medicine. There's no need to be treating high blood pressure if you don't have it. Now, um, uh, so we also discussed the issue of diabetics they do not need the low protein diet that is not recommended because diabetics with a very low protein diet could wind up getting hypoglycemic so yep, very um, dangerous yeah yeah all right so what about um if you have difficult to control high blood pressure now, i don't know how many of you have gone to your doctor that and, was me. J James is one of them. And let's go over some of the reasons why your blood pressure is not controlled to the target levels that we just discussed. First thing, you got to take your medicine. <laughs> it's amazing how many people come to the doctor and they haven't taken their medicine. So my first question to anybody who I see in the clinic is, did you take your medicine today? And you should take your medicine regularly, including when you go to the, your doctor, so they can see how that blood pressure medicine is working. Not, not so. just when you go to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, listen, it's it's probably at least twenty five to fifty percent of folks are not taking their medicine the way they should, and that's why blood pressure is a huge issue. Yeah, and so, I used to fall in that category. Now I use an app, and it will bug me on my phone, my watch, my morning doses, and my late afternoon doses. I have never missed one since I've installed the app. Before, missing was something that would happen. I take all of my medicines at night, and most blood pressure medicines can be given once a day. And if possible, I try to get my patients on once a day blood pressure medicine. So what are the things that can make you out of control? Too much drinking. Booze will raise your blood pressure a bunch. Taking things like a lot of folks are taking stuff for attention deficit, like Adderall and Ritalin, that can affect your blood pressure. Certainly street drugs like cocaine can affect your blood pressure. We've discussed the white coat phenomenon, high blood pressure in your doctor's office. Um, another thing that is often uh, done wrong is patients are not getting the water pill. You need to get a diuretic with a blood pressure drug. All blood pressure drugs do better if you take it with a diuretic. Um, and we're going to get into dietary sodium a whole bunch later, but that's another reason why blood pressure may not be controlled because you're eating far too much salt and sodium. So what about particular blood pressure drugs for particular situations? Now we've talked a lot about the ACEs and the ARBs. Mm -hmm. uh, the ACEs are the Prills. The ARBs are the TANS. ACEs like Captopril. ARBs uh, uh, like... Um, Give me an ARB. Uh, Losartan. I don't take any ARB, ARB, That's what ARB, I used to ARB, take. ARBs are the TANs. Losartan. Candesartan. Okay. And the ACEs are the Pril. Captopril. Benazapril. Enalapril. Okay. Now, um, those drugs are being pushed a lot. And I don't know if you know this, James, but they are weak sisters. They do not drop blood pressure much. 
So if you got a serious blood pressure problem, a lot of doctors just go to these ACEs and the ARBs because they have a lot of good benefits. They benefit your heart, they could benefit your kidney, but they can also make kidney function worse, which we discussed. But unless you have protein in the urine and kidney disease, an ACE or an ARB is not essential. If you are a diabetic, you can make a case even without it. But I would say ACEs and ARBs for anyone with CKD and urine protein. Now, what about some of the other types of blood pressure medicines? I, I try to tailor the meds I give patients to their problem. Some patients have prostate problems and there's drugs that can not only help you pass your water better, but help your blood pressure. These are called alpha blockers. They're called terazosin, um, doxazosin. So, you know, you may want to ask about that. If you have had a heart attack, you should be on a beta blocker to prevent future problems from your heart. If you've got a fast heart rate, like atrial fibrillation, there are certain blood pressure drugs that can slow your heart rate. Clonidine is one of these drugs. I, That's I, the I one, use a lot. I have that one, 0. 0.2 in the morning, 0. 0.3 in the late afternoon. That's the one I dislike. Here's my deal, James. Clonidine will make you sleepy. Yes. Clonidine could give you a dry mouth. There's a couple ways to get around that. Take it at night, and that's all I do. I give it one dose at night. Or there's a patch that has clonidine. You could take put a patch on. It'll last three days. So that's two Ooh. choices on, on the clonidine. Yeah. Now, clonidine is a strong blood pressure medicine. Mm -hmm. If people are having problems, you're not going to get it under control with the ACEs. You may get it under control with um, some of the calcium channel blockers like amlodipine or nifedipine. Those are, I take that those one are, also with the so, clonidine and some others. And, and those are stronger, the clonidine and nifedipine. And if you are one of these folks that your blood pressure is not controllable, ask your doctor about minoxidil. It is extremely powerful, M-I-N-O-X-I-D-Y-L. It is extremely powerful, and it is a drug that will get just about anyone's blood pressure under control. Um, now, if you are happen to have heart failure and you're African-American, hydralazine is another blood pressure drug that might be considered. Um, you, now, we can move from here to talk some about the diet issues. All right. And unless you want to, unless you have questions. Uh, before Actually, we get into um, this is great to hear because my blood pressure was very, very difficult to get under control. I used to take Losartan, one tablet and some other tablet, probably a water pill. And that was it for, for probably a decade and a half to control my blood pressure. But once my kidneys really got bad, I've got, I'm looking at my list, amlodipine, I take once a day, Clondine, I take it twice a day, a 0.2 and a 0.3, because a 0.5, I'm asleep, yep. um, no matter how hard I try. The 0.3 I like in the late afternoon, because it winds me down at night and helps me fall yep. asleep. Yep. Um, I also take Metoprol. Metoprolol. Yeah, Metoprolol, ER, 300 milligrams a day. So it's yep. three yep. 100 pills. Those are expensive. That one I don't like because of that. Spirolactone? Yeah. Spirolactone is a mineralocorticoid blocker. So here's here's something that I, I, I'm not going to get into personal stuff. Yeah. But I've discussed James's situation. And James may be one of the folks that have what we call secondary hypertension. That's another reason for blood pressure being difficult to control. So kidney disease itself can give you tough blood pressure, but there's other things like narrowing of the arteries to the kidneys, especially in older folks, that can give you difficult to control blood pressure. Certain glands, the, the um, uh, mineralocoids will affect the adrenal glands. Sometimes the adrenal glands are pushing out too much of their aldosterone or their renin. So there are secondary forms of hypertension that would be situations where blood pressure is very difficult to control. 
But let's move on to, and by the way, Jay, metoprolol, I don't, if you are on an expensive drug, most drugs are generic. Do not be afraid to ask your doctor or your pharmacist, hey doc, hey pharmacist, is there a generic version of this drug? Because they're pennies versus dollars or tens of dollars. Yeah. And metoprolol twice a day, generic is, you don't have to spend money on fancy extended release. Because you're taking twice a day drugs anyway, and that's what I would do. Yeah, exactly. Well, in March, so next month, I go in, and we're going to look at trying some different medication um, so that I can get rid of that Clondine 0.2 milligram in the morning. Because come 11 to 2 o'clock throughout the day, would, yeah, it is tough staying I, awake. I, I would either just take the patch, James, or I'd just mm -hmm. take it at night. I take 0.4 or 0.6 at night. Now let's go into the diet. Okay. So um, I've learned a lot about diet since I wrote my book for patients because diet is something that people are really concerned about with good reason. Um, and well, and it's book, the one thing we can control, which is what yeah. I love about it. I get to yeah. make those choices. My medication, I don't. The doctors figure it yeah. out and it took them a while but they got this combination and my blood pressure is great it's always right on track but my diet i can control that and that's what i like about it so my book i talk about the smart diet uh tonight we're going to talk about the dash diet does that ring a bell james have you heard about yes. the dash okay the dash well, diet. <laughs> that's a good heart diet well let me i, I mean i okay i'm going to tell you a funny story in a minute so we got the DASH diet, we got the Mediterranean diet. They're all pretty much the same, folks. They're all just about the same. And I'm going to tell you the story about the DASH diet. So, James, I went from the, I would say, the 70s all the way through, you know, till about maybe five, six years ago. Every year I go to the high blood pressure meetings. Mm -hmm. And there would be one of my colleagues. And like I said, I presented at these meetings. And one of my colleagues... He'd get up there talking about the DASH diet, and i go, oh, poo, 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 you know. And I, I never really took it seriously until for tonight's show. I actually studied up on the DASH diet, and I am impressed as hell. <laughs> hey, that is <laughs> you know, fantastic. And, you know, you know I'm, fi I'm finally learning something in my old age. So what does DASH stand for? Most people don't know. It's the diet. It's called the diet approach to stop hypertension. Wait. Diet Wait. approach to stop hypertension. That's what DASH was. And uh, most people, you know, figure, well, what's this diet approach to stop hypertension? It must have been salt. No, the original diet had nothing to do with salt. How do you like that? The original study that came out in New England Journal of Medicine uh, about 25 years ago now, so this DASH diet is high in fruits and vegetables. Hello, plant-based diet, same old yes. stuff. Yes. Low fat dairy, whole grains, poultry, fish, not tiny amounts of red meat. Stay away from the sweets and added sugar. Stay away from the saturated fats and, and decrease your cholesterol. So this diet, uh, this study was very impressive and they randomized people to different diets. And if you, were, if you had high blood pressure, you could drop your blood pressure by 11 points being on the diet without a pill. That's impressive. Wow. A, lot yeah. of, a, lot of, a lot of drugs we give, they don't drop blood pressure by that kind of, I mean, some of the powerful ones will, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. And so they, in this study, they compare just your average fruit and vegetable diet uh, to the, um, the, the DASH diet that I just described. And it had, and here's something else that, that um, I, I, I'm, I'm seeming to get a little blurry here. I don't know if it's my, my um, streaming here, but okay. Yeah, it looks good on I this guess, end. I, okay, good, good, okay. Um, so here's another important thing for all of the CKD folks. They looked at the DASH diet in relationship to people with kidney problems. And in my book, when I talk about my SMART diet, which is essentially the DASH diet that we're talking about, 
which I emphasize fiber and plant-based mm -hmm. diet. They looked at the relationship of this diet to progression of kidney disease, and guess what? Especially in diabetics, this kind of plant-based diet slowed the decline of kidney function. And, awesome. And, but here's, here's something, let me ask you, James. What would be a concern if you're a kidney patient with this kind of diet? Have you been tuned into that, plugged into that issue? No, a lot of, I'd want to lot make of sure plants. I'm not getting, not lot getting lot malnutrition, you know, not missing no. anything. You're getting plenty of protein, you're uh -huh. getting plenty of everything. What if, what do kidney patients worry about as far as an electrolyte? Oh yeah. Which one? I do not know. Potassium. Oh, they're gonna, see, potassium, I'm the, I'm the, potassium. I'm the, I'm the low potassium guy. I need more. Right. Right. And, 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 and as we, I'm not going to get into it tonight, but you may be one of these rare aldosterone kind of things, which can affect potassium. But, um, if you've got stage five CKD, potassium can become a problem and plant-based diets, they have their benefit because they're high in potassium. So this diet is fine for people with stage three and four CKD Stage five, I would be a little bit not as as enthusiastic about this diet, this DASH diet, this plant-based diet. And in people who have a potassium that's around four and a half or less, this diet worked fine and it, and it will help you with your blood pressure and will help you slow the decline of your kidney function. And plant-based diets also have phosphorus. They have a lot of potassium mm -hmm. and phosphorus but the phosphorus in plants, as opposed to the phosphorus that's added to your foods that is a preservative, it's not digestible. So it's not going to pump up your phosphorus. Yeah. When so, renal dietitian Jen Hernandez, about two weeks ago, we were talking about phosphorus and how the um, additive, the pro, you know, that type of phosphorus is absorbed 80 to 100% where the natural phosphorus can be as low as 20 or 30 percent absorption rate so it's much better to get your phosphorus naturally in fruits and vegetables and other plants yeah and um so this dash diet was studied with uh the first study was not about salt not about sodium it was studied in another study where they took people with their on normal diet with normal sodium intake. Normal sodium intake for Americans is around three and a half grams of sodium. And we're gonna get into the recommended levels, which are a lot less. So they compared people. You just came off the street, you're on a normal diet, you're not on any particular plant-based diet, you'd eat your sodium as, as you normally would. And, and then they compared that to, so they, they started you on that diet, which you've been on, then they moved you over to this DASH diet, high in fruits and vegetables, low fat dairy, whole grains, poultry, no red meat, knocking off the sweets and sugars, uh, decrease your saturated fats and cholesterol. And they also reduced the sodium in the diet. Uh, they reduced it uh, to about half of what they were taking and guess what? If you were hypertensive, had high blood pressure, your blood pressure went down 12 points. That awesome. is impressive, impressive, impressive. So sodium is important. And one of the things that to me is, is most concerning is that doctors who are not tuned into the sodium story, ignored it or whatever, or poo-pooed it, if you got a person with resistant high blood pressure, part of the problem may be they may be taking their drugs, but they're eating so much salt that their blood pressure stays out of control. Yeah. So and the standard so, diet is is so is a lot of salt here in the U.S. Right. Right. So my next question, James. Let me see if you get this one right. <laughs> I'll put him on the spot. No processed food. No <laughs> fast food. Did I get it right? <laughs> All right, so where, 
Um, how much of the sodium uh, that you're getting in your diet is coming from table salt? Half, three quarters. Table salt, as in we're adding it ourselves? Salt shaker, yeah. I would 25%, say- 25%, 50%, 75%. I'm thinking a third, so 25%. It's gotta be very little from that. I think most of it is in the processed food already or we're going through the drive through window and there's just so much sodium already in that food. Well, you are right about the second part of your answer, but salt only, only accounts for 5% of our sodium intake. Added salt is, I, I mean, there are some people that, are, that go crazy with added salt, but on average, we're not getting most of our salt from the table shaker, salt mm-hmm. shaker. Most of it's coming what James just said. It's the processed foods. We get most of that salt from processed foods and going out to restaurants, especially the ones with the arches and the ones that have the fast food that your kids like and a lot of folks like. But that stuff is bad, bad, bad. And they're trying to make it healthier, but there's a lot, a lot of sodium and we're gonna get into that in a minute, in these foods that you're eating that are processed or coming from the fast food joints. One tip I was given, and it's worked great for me here at home to cut down on the salt you put from the shaker, is to get rid of the shaker and get a grinder. So I have a grinder, so now I have to work to get the salt (laughs) out, so I'm aware of how much is coming out with each little twist. And it takes a lot to get a lot of salt out when you have the grinder. Where with the shaker, all it takes is a, a kid saying they need something. Like, yeah, and all, boom, all of a sudden, too much sodium. Well, it's really ironic when you think about it because kidney folks worry about potassium. And with stage five, potassium can start going up. And we'll have another show about potassium. High potassium can be very dangerous. And most folks with kidney problems have probably been informed about that. But the thing about potassium is that potassium is, is actually good for the kidneys. Uh, potassium will, uh, will decrease your risk of progressive kidney disease. Um, if you take in more sodium and a lot less potassium, which is meaning that you're not getting much of the plant-based diet, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to have a higher risk of kidney stones, of heart problems. So you want to try to increase the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains. You wanna stay away from things that are white, the white rice, the white bread, the white crackers, the, the um, pizzas. And, um, and we'll give you an idea why these things can be a problem. So if you, um, it, a lot of people want to be vegan and uh, some of the things that are cheeses or other things that are made vegan have a ton of sodium. Mm -hmm. You folks got to start looking at labels. You want to look at your labels to see what's the sodium in the thing you're eating. What's the saturated fats of what you're eating? How much added sugar is there? Okay. And a lot of of those plant-based substitutes are loaded with sodium, um, the incredible burger, the, incre- you know, the incredible meats. Those things are so high in sodium, it is crazy. One patty of theirs, um, 700 and something milligrams of sodium. That's wow. half of your sodium for many people in one patty. Plus you're gonna add the bun and other things, the pickles, you're just adding more and more sodium. Half of our sodium, is coming from what you just said, bread and rolls and pizza. Mm -hmm. Uh, The rest of it is coming from cold cuts, uh, snacks, uh, cheeses. So um, uh, things that are good to eat are quinoa, brown rice, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, we already talked about. And uh, try to stay away from the refined white breads, white sugar, uh, and so forth. And certainly, Sweetened beverages, real bad, real bad. And you want food that have nutritional value and things that are white and easy to digest, things you don't have to chew, often don't have much nutritional value. 
So um, let's talk about some of the uh, high flyers in, in our diet as far as sodium. Um, what about a quarter pounder? How much sodium, James? And a quarter pounder from McDonald's, I'm going to guess 600 milligrams. A thousand. A thousand. Oh, I wasn't thinking <laughs> the bread, too, and all the other stuff. A That's thousand. Ridiculous. And, a thousand. And I'm not going to get full on a quarter pounder. A quarter pounder is not as big as it sounds. <laughs> and a thousand milligrams? Holy yep. cow. Yep, yep. And uh, you want to have an egg McMuffin? About the same, maybe 800. <laughs> Um, Make it at home and, a whole lot yep, less. <laughs> yep, yep, and um, and you want to? Ha- oh, why, why don't we get healthy? Grilled chicken Caesar salad. How about that? How much sodium? Well, I'm going to guess the dressing and and the the chicken's going to have a lot. I'm going to say 800 milligrams. A thousand. You're close. A thousand. <laughs> well, a thousand is a lot more than eight hundred. <laughs> For me, I like to keep my meals at 800, and I just eat two meals a day. So I try to get around 1,600 milligrams, somewhere around there is my target. Uh, 1,000 is a lot for a salad, and I'm sure some dressings have even more sodium in it <laughs> yeah. you know, when you're adding yeah. it on there. Yeah, yeah. Let's go up the ante. Let's go out to the Chinese restaurant. <laughs> oh, it's all, oh, yeah, that is hard to do. Uh, okay, Mongolian beef. Oh, I used to love that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Take a guess. 1,200. 2,300. 2,300. That is more than a person should have in it. For a regular person, that's like at the top if they're allowed to have a lot of sodium. Whoa! Four little chicken egg rolls. You're, you're breaking my heart. No, I don't eat Asian too often unless it's <laughs> stir fry. It's always very heavy in the veggies. <laughs> Three grams. <laughs> Hot and sour soup, my favorite. <gasps> wait, wait. That one I do get. I never, I actually have never checked it. Three grams. And I get the large. I chicken, love hot and sour soup. Chicken lo mein, two and a half grams. So look, oh. I'm, we're not going to tell people to stop having Asian food, but you got to be aware of this. If you're having a steady diet of fast food, a steady diet of Asian food, you're not doing yourself a favor with regard to sodium and the bad effects that sodium are going to have on your body. Uh, and the bad, we're going to get into those in just a minute. Well, and if so, anyone does eat fast food, it needs to be seen as the occasional treat, not as a meal replacement. You can't be hitting it once a day or several times a week. Even once a week, that's probably the maximum you should even consider dining out if you're on you know these restrictions because it's going to be really difficult to you know, stay within your, your allowances that your doctor sets for you. Look, and, and, you know, you can, you can have celebrations, but you want to have a plant-based diet lifestyle. You want to have a low sodium diet lifestyle. You want to have exercise in your lifestyle. And it's not just for yourself. This is a family decision. Your kids, you know, one out of 10 kids are having high blood pressure when they're kids. And diabetes in kids is an enormous problem. There is an epidemic of obesity and diabetes in kids. Mm -hmm. And you want to do this not just for yourself so you'll live longer and your kidney function won't decline so quickly, if at all. But you also want to protect your kids. So, yeah, the fast food restaurants should be an occasional thing. And you want your kids... Most kids don't eat fruits and vegetables. You want to get them, if they don't like vegetables, let them eat fruits. There's all kinds of fruits. And you my want kids to try- are the exact opposite. When we go out, they want the broccoli. They love yeah. cauliflower, squash, cucumbers. We didn't get them brought up on French fries and all those just because we wanted them to be healthy. And yeah. they love it. Yeah. yeah. You're doing it for your family. 
So here's something about what is the increased sodium doing? It's going to mess up your heart. It can affect your heart muscle. It can uh, also increase your urine protein. Taking lots of sodium in your diet can increase your urine protein, which may in turn be a factor for your progression of kidney function loss. And high sodium will increase your calcium in your urine, and that could cause weakening of your bones, osteoporosis, mm -hmm. and kidney stones. So there's lots of reasons to decrease the sodium in your diet. And the recommendations go from the Heart Association, which says 1,500, James. That's pretty low. Uh, the U.S. Department of Ag says 2,300. That's 2.3 grams. American Heart Association, a gram and a half. And you heard about some of the foods we talked about. You can see how quickly you get there. And if oh, yeah. you look at food packages, you'll see how quickly you're going to get there. And the kidney organization. Well, one other thing about food packaging, not only do we need to read the number, we need to read the serving size. A lot yeah. of these now sound healthy because one package is two servings or two and a half. Right. So you need to double that number sometimes. Right. Well, they, they should give it to you both total. So there's two labels. One is the total in the package and the other is per serving. So like James says, look at it per serving. And um, the, the kidney organization, the one we talk about a lot, the kidney, uh, International Kidney Organization, they recommend two grams. So, you know, somewhere between a gram and a half to two and a half grams, certainly way below the three to four grams, which is the average that you folks should be shooting for. And um, one of the things we've discussed that's very common for kidney patients, especially as you get older, if you're a patient has abnormal kidney function, you're likely to also have a weak heart. That's very, very common with progressive kidney problems. And if you've got a weak heart, sodium can be really a disastrous thing. Taking a lot of sodium can wind up putting you in the hospital with fluid overload, with fluid in your lungs. So you got to be real careful about your sodium intake, especially um, if you've got uh, uncontrolled blood pressure or if you're one of these folks that's got uh, heart problems. So, James, I think we, do we got any questions? Because I think we got some time. Oh, if you got we questions. have lots of great questions. Okay. And I just want to let people know there's a lot of people asking about different foods, like, you know, uh, different fast food options. Uh, renal dietitian Jen Hernandez, about two weeks ago, we did a 2021 update on great or better fast food choices for kidney patients. So if you go to dadvicetv.com, the website, and there's a search, just type fast food and you'll see the 2020 version and the 2021 version. And she talks <clears throat> about portion control and menu options that are better choices for kidney patients. Fast food's not good for us, but we can make better choices. And I want to add one more thing. We have a few new people asking about diets. Um, a renal dietitian is a great help to help you find what diet works for you. You can make almost any diet work for you. You just need to know your limits and control portions. Some of us will have stricter potassium or phosphorus or calcium limits compared to others. And that's where a renal dietitian can help you learn what you need based on your health, your activities, your lifestyle, and your labs. And then it's you're, you kind of get these allowances and you eat within those. Uh, let's go through some of these questions that we have here. We have some that are not related to today's topic, but I'd like to have you touch on them because we've talked about them before. Someone asked, how can I lower my creatinine? Okay, well, I, I have discussed this many times on the show. There is no point in thinking about how to lower your creatinine because that doesn't do anything for your kidneys. You have creatinine as a measure. It's an innocent bystander. It's just a, something in your blood that is a measure of kidney function. You should not be trying to figure out what foods affect it because that's nonsense. Your, your long-term kidney function is what you need to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. 
and you're just like your blood pressure numbers you need to have repeated numbers repeated numbers of your creatinine value over time will tell you how your kidneys are doing there is no point to trying to lower your creatinine because that's not doing anything for your kidneys i will address something here how does high cholesterol affect yeah, that was the next blood one. pressure okay <laughs> well well let me let me tell you this now as opposed to sodium which is something that I think I should have paid more attention to as a physician. And I think all of you folks need to pay more attention to because it clearly has potential harms and you can try to really decrease it with lots of potential benefits. Now, cholesterol, um, I think that if you are a CKD patient, especially if you've got uh, EGFR, of let's say 45 or less, I think your risk for cardiovascular problems, your risk of having hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis is high enough that I would put my patients with that risk factor on a cholesterol medicine. And these medicines, there's a whole bunch to choose from. They've been shown to be beneficial and I would shoot to lower that risk factor, just like you want to have a target blood pressure, a target for your blood sugar, you want to have a target for your bad cholesterol, your LDL, I would shoot for get my bad cholesterol below 100. And for most folks, it means taking a cholesterol medicine. Um, Great. And John here has a good question. Says, I take hydro there we go. And he's not African-American. And yeah. you had mentioned that that may okay. be a good option. Yeah. Can you expand yeah. on it? Okay. So hydralazine is one of the oldest drugs. I used it way, way back. It is uh, a drug that is a pretty good, strong drug. Uh, but here's the thing. If it's, it's what they call a vasodilator. It opens up blood vessels. And what those kinds of drugs, and minoxidil, the one I told you about, which is the drug that will get anybody under control, real powerful. Hydralazine is a weak sister of minoxidil. But if you're on hydralazine, it's a good drug, but you need to be on the water pill that everybody needs to be on with their blood pressure medicine. And that kind of drug can raise your heart rate. So you need to be on either the clonidine we talked about or a beta blocker. So it's fine to use them. They're very cheap. They're very old drugs, the pennies probably to buy, but they need to be used right. And they're fine for treating high blood pressure. What I was talking about is they've also been used to treat heart failure. That's a separate issue. So I was talking about people who have not only high blood pressure, but heart failure is another uh, problem. But cholesterol probably is, is, is no good demonstration that there's a relationship between cholesterol and decline of kidney function. As opposed right. to, uh, yeah. Very good. Yes, okay. Yep. And Nadine asked earlier, right after she takes her BP, her blood pressure medications, her blood pressure goes way down. Is that something she should be concerned about? Okay. So here's, um, I don't know what you mean by way down, but um, any drug has a certain onset of action. And for most blood pressure drugs, it's anywhere between a half an hour to let's say two hours, and sometimes even four hours before they peak. Now, what you may be having is a cumulative effect. You may have the last dose of blood pressure. So you, so when you dose drugs, you want the drug dose to come down, and then it goes back up, and then it comes back down. But you may have an accumulation, especially if you're taking drugs more than once a day. So you may need an adjustment uh, on your dose if your blood pressure before you take the dose is low. If your blood pressure before you take the dose is, is up in the, in the 140, 150, 160 range, that's fine that it's dropping it. But you want to be aware of potential episodes of low blood pressure or stacking, they call it, of accumulation of drugs. And you may want to see if you're taking your drugs too frequently. Like I said, twice a day is the maximum anybody should be taking blood pressure medicines with today's drugs. And I try to get people on once a day. Very good. 
And probably the last question, since we're getting to the top of the hour, what are some natural ways that you recommend that we can try to lower or manage our blood pressure? Okay, so the most important things to do, and this is, again, blood pressure is one of the factors, like your kidney number, that will affect your chance of getting hardening of the arteries and the bad outcomes like strokes and heart attacks and so forth. <coughs> you want to <coughs> try to get adequate sleep, at least seven or eight hours of sleep a night. You want to try to uh, reduce your alcohol intake. You want to, if you are somebody who can exercise, and not, you, no, I shouldn't say that, everybody needs to exercise. This is prescribed. You must exercise as part of your lifestyle. It is the most important thing you're going to do. Daily exercise, at least 30 minutes. You don't have to go to a gym. You don't have to, you know, run marathons. To even go out, take it a walk. Exactly. So exercise will lower your blood pressure and it will lower your stress. And some people uh, are into yoga and some people are into meditation. And I highly recommend both of those as, as natural ways to decrease your blood pressure and try to decrease the stress in your life. For most things that you worry about, it's not worth worrying about. You'll look at the things that you're worrying about after the fact and you go, oh boy, I should never have let that occupy my brain. And that's another thing that's gonna push your blood pressure up. Yep, and I do all of those. No smoking, no <laughs> drinking. I never was oh, a okay. smoker. Okay, okay. And, okay. and I was too cheap to drink. <laughs> <laughs> never did drugs or anything like that. And I now walk. That's my favorite form of exercise. For Christmas, I got a treadmill. It's in one of the, the rooms and I go on there and I get my steps while it's cold and snowy outside here in Ohio. I'm yeah. getting it on the treadmill and I feel great. And like you said, not only is it good for you and good for your heart, but it helps you clear your mind, get rid of stress. It's a great way to kind of like just work off the day. Let me answer one quick question. We've got a minute. If you have low blood pressure, can you take more sodium? So here's the deal. Low blood pressure is a good thing. Low blood pressure, if it's not causing symptoms, don't worry about it. It's a low blood pressure that's getting you to feel funky. It's getting you to have a problem with dizziness or weakness. I mean, people that live the longest generally have an average of a low blood pressure throughout their life. Now, if you are symptomatic from a low blood pressure, then not a bad idea to increase your salt intake, but that's pretty unusual. Okay. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, that brings us to the top of the hour. Dr. Rowe, awesome. Tons of great information. And I'd like to thank everyone out there watching. If you haven't done so already, hop on over to YouTube and subscribe to Dadvice TV. Click the little bell icon. And every time there's a new video like this one, you'll get a notification so you don't miss it. All right, everybody, have a great rest of your evening and I'll see you tomorrow in the next video. Bye everyone. Bye, Dr. Rowe.